Got it. All right, Brandon, we are live. Thank you so much for taking out some time. Means a lot. Um, absolutely, absolutely. we've got a lot to discuss today. You got new albums, you got a movie, you got a tour coming up. Um, let's start with uh Metalocalypse Age of the Doomstar. Um for Army, you, Army of the Doomstar. <laughs> what happened? Army of the Doomstar, yes. Army Sorry, but... of the Doomstar. Army of the Doomstar. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it for Here you to continue this story? Like nearly ten years later, uh, it's a you know it's kind of a crazy process um, because these characters in this world and all this stuff live somewhere inside of my head, and oftentimes when I'm going about my day, I'm not thinking about it, you know, um, and uh, my relationship with the show is that you know. When I'm finished with an episode, or when I'm finished with a season, or I'm finished with any of that stuff, I don't tend to revisit it. But it doesn't matter because, it, like I said, it's all just it's it lives inside of me. So so it takes a little while to wake it up and to start doing the the characters and start getting into the you know what this needs to be. But plus, I I kind of like that we had the this interim time because um because um. Because I think there's a lot of fun stuff that we got to apply to this storytelling that a bunch of tricks that we didn't have 10 years ago. So um, well, so it's nice to come back to it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And, uh, you know, I recently had a chance to see a screener of the movie. So, wow, I, I thought it was great. But, um, you know, why wasn't it like a rock opera, like the Doomstar Requiem? Was that too hard? Or uh... No, it wasn't too hard. It's just that we did the Doomstar Requiem. We, I mean, this whole the whole idea of Metalocalypse is that we just don't want to repeat ourselves. What's the point, you know? I mean, uh, the rock opera, you know, first of all, the Doomstar Requiem, nobody asked for a rock opera. <laughs> we, just did it. we just did it because I thought, I've got an hour here to play with. And I think this story is going to be tricky to tell unless I'm kind of really hitting every single line with dialogue and and music when you're doing a rock opera or something you have this ability to say the inside voice and the outside voice like the subtext and the text kind of at the same time so uh. so i i really enjoyed that um i really enjoyed that uh that style of, of storytelling and uh i did it once we got a 20 piece orchestra uh, i'm sorry a 50 piece orchestra to play with us we got to arrange it. We got to really have a lot of fun with it. And uh, like I said, nobody asked us to do it. We just thought, <laughs> let's just do something really crazy. And for this movie, the whole idea for this movie is to really treat it like a movie, to treat it like a feature, to not treat it like a long episode of a TV show, to have like distinctive act breaks, to have a lot of tone, to have a lot of mood. Um, one thing that we came back to often, just as far as the scope and the... Uh, and the grandiosity of this project is kind of like thinking about Star Trek, the TV series, you know, with Captain Kirk and, sure, of course. and Leonard Nimoy and everybody versus Star Trek, the movie, Star Trek, the motion picture, Star Trek, the wrath of Khan. There's a big tonal shift in that. And so that was something we we're really conscious of. And that was what, that's what kind of got us excited about doing this was treating it with a little bit more gravitas. That's awesome, man. You know, I mean, the film is, uh, it's stacked with a laundry list of great, you know, performers like King Diamond, Kirk Hammett, uh, Scott Ian, Amy Lee. I mean, how'd you end up getting everyone on board? Um, let's see. I mean, it's uh, these are all. I mean, these are all relationships we had. You know, King Diamond had been on the show before. Scott Ian's a buddy. Um, he uh, he's been on the show before too. Uh, Thundercat, who you you know, a lot of people know him as this avant-garde kind of neo soul guy, but he was in suicidal tendencies also. Sure. Uh, and he also played bass on a song in the Doomstar Requiem. And um, we also, uh, Amy Lee was someone that uh, Ulrich Wilde, the producer that I work with on the Death Clock Records, um, he sent me a message. He said, Amy Lee is a fan of the show. And I bet we could, uh, if you want, I could probably introduce you to her people. And I said, oh, yeah, that would be absolutely great. Um, so 
so yeah, and then King Diamond and uh, Livia Zita, his wife. Yeah. Um, she's a great voiceover actor, and I talked to King Diamond for a while, and I said, "What do you think? Would you like to do this?" And he was, he's he's always game for cool stuff, and he's the coolest guy in the world. So, so uh, all that stuff was really cool, and everyone was very excited. Um, and Kirk Hammett is in it, and uh, you know, and then we've got people that are not heavy metal people like John Hamm. We've got Mark Hamill. We've got Malcolm McDowell. Uh, Victor Brandt, who's been a part of the show for a long time and has a really uh, cool thing he gets to do in this, this one. That's I awesome. Him and calling people, yeah. That's awesome, dude. I love it. Um, you know, uh, we get not one, but uh, but two albums coming out. We have the Companion soundtrack, for Army mm-hmm. of Doomstar, and then, of course, the Death Album 4, which has been, you know, uh, now over 10 years since the last album. So what would you say was your approach with bringing these albums to life, you know, both of them? How was that? Well, um, I'll talk about Death Album 4 first. Sure. Because, um, I mean, the whole idea is, we're, you know, the movie's got a lot of intensity the movie's got a lot of mood and a lot of gravitas and that's what i wanted to i wanted the to notch up the record in intensity so that was kind of an overall thought was let's make this just a little bit more intense let's make this a little bit more big and grandiose and and deep and so half the record is these super fast furious getting a fight kind of intense songs and then the other half is bigger more expansive mystical pieces and so so i didn't really construct it that way we kind of built the record that way just because that's the best way it sounded and gene hoagland has a big part of that and gene hoagland is the drummer that i've been working with for a long time legendary heavy metal drummer yeah part of a death dark angel founding member of dark angel testament anyway he and i've been working together for a really long time and we have a really easy flow where i um i'll work out these songs I, I had like somewhere around 40 something demos some of them are songs some of them are just riff ideas some of them were just little ideas and, and uh, i went through like during the pandemic and i kind of sculpted it down to songs that i thought would be um a good representation of where death clock is now because the idea is you know it has been a long time and the DNA is the same. It just keeps on mutating from the first episode, first record to the second record to the third record to the fourth record. It just same DNA just keeps on mutating, keeps getting more intense. Right. So that was part of the death album. That's just a very simple uh, kind of take on that. Plus, I have two songs that are in the movie that are also on the record. Right. Exactly. Um, and uh, and then, you know, some other ideas that are like kind of bigger, like a, the, the whole record ends with kind of like the Viking funeral of all things Metalocalypse. So that's kind of thematically what's happening. And uh, then the album is the Viking Funeral, and the movie is the Viking Funeral. And then the soundtrack is something very different. It's a very different approach because I love film music. Right. I love the music of, you know, Goblin and oh, yeah. John Carpenter. I love John Williams. I love uh, uh, Jerry Goldsmith. I love John Barry, who did like the music for James Bond movies. Uh, I love Hans Zimmer. I love uh, love all these guys. So, uh, so that's kind of what I, and oh, I like uh, Basil Paladoris who did the Conan music. So I love big, crazy brass because th- that just does so much for a movie. Oh. An intense score does so much for a movie. So I knew that I was going to be taking all of the energy that I would have in a rock opera or something and put it all into the score. And really, if you close your eyes and listen to this whole score, you're being being told a story with no dialogue and to me that's a really exciting thing as a musician as a guy who went to music school and all that stuff so i really i really wanted to challenge myself and i also because i worked with bear mccreary who did so much tv music and movie music you know he did the walking dead he did uh he did the new uh lord of the rings on anyway so basically i was talking to him about an approach for this thing and he said hey why don't you use my team his team is called Sparks and Shadows, and it's uh, arrangers, it's uh, admin, it's all kinds of different people together that take my music and help me get it ready for an orchestra. So in this case, we would go to and use the uh, Budapest Orchestra to get strings and French horns and stuff. And then there are pieces of music that have no 
orchestral stuff, some just digital and cool synth, drippy, wet synthesizers and cool shit like that. Yeah. And then, uh, and then there's score that's just me and Gene Hoagland and and guitars and bass and and like heavy metal score too. So there's it really spans a big, huge kind of wide style there's a bunch of different styles that kind of all come together and uh so that was really fun it was really new i like scoring a lot it's the it was the most fun i had making this whole thing because scripts are hard acting is all crazy doing a record is always like oh you got to get your guitar just nailed down and everything's right no 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 mistakes all that stuff but the score was just a really fun way to really dig in and uh and express the movie in another way I love it, man. So, it's so all that cool. stuff's happening at once. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Oh, man, that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and you revisited one of your, uh, one of my favorite songs, Mermaider, uh, you know, in Mermaider 3. What made you kind of come back to this track? Um, Just more because, to say? Because uh, I think it was a fitting, it's a fitting ending to, I think, thematically, what the music is, what the world is, you know, this whole, this whole project, in order to kind of finish a project like this, you have to go back to the beginning. You have to look at your first episode. And our first episode has a lot of, uh, has a lot of really important information that was deliberately put in there. You know, how we meet Death Clock the, for this kind of, I'm a gear in the wheel of the clock chances. That's the first thing you hear in the very first episode. And the first two episodes are almost like two different, completely, t- completely different TV shows. One of them takes place where we're introducing the band to you and the world around the band. The second one is when we go deep into the ocean. And that sticks around for a very long time. Right. And the underwater stuff, the mermaider stuff, Thunder Horse, all that stuff is kind of derived in that, in that second episode so that's something that just that just that 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 push um kept on happening and it's really fun to 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 do variations on a theme and then push it into its third act into its big final epic again viking funeral and so that's that's part of the reason that i felt a, a necessity to come back it's epic man i love it um you know, I'm pretty partial to uh, track number five, uh, Bloodbath. Um, what would yeah. you say was the was your favorite track on on uh, Death Album Four so far, and what was the most difficult to produce? You know, well, um, there's a lot of different kind of stuff, you know, um, inside of this this world. Again, there's like really fast, aggressive stuff. There's kind of epic big um almost like power metal which i would say bloodbath is part of that okay. um and bloodbath is also just like a, a song to to get in a fight to that's these are the <laughs> songs like mutilation on a saturday night is a, a party song to get in a fight to uh i think like gardener of vengeance is a song to get in a fight to um <laughs> poison <laughs> by food is a song to uh to vomit too um <laughs> i think uh um D- dead face is a, is a, another song that's like it's mystical it's bigger but those are the notes of the song d-e-a-d-f-a-c-e and it's it derives from the movie as well so there's a different approach to that song and again it was the idea how can i make these notes that spell out dead face into a song and those are the notes if you want to learn how to play it the notes are d-e-a-d-f-a-c-e and wow. what it that song yields is something really mystical and deep and crazy. And I've gotten some really cool responses about that song, too. So I'm excited for people to check that out. And then there are songs that are like, again, more mystical, like Horse of Fire is, is loosely linked to the movie as well. And Satellite Bleeding are also these kind of mystical sides that, that, that I see as ha- being kind of an addendum to the movie as well. Um, difficult to produce. I'd say like, you know, the song of salvation is a tricky one, but I really like where that landed. SOS is the song and aortic desecration. They're very different. They're very different kinds of songs, you know? So I just wanted to, so the question is, you know, you know, what can we do to make this feel like a death clock record? And also what haven't we done tone wise, feel wise that makes this, that puts this in a different place. So, so those are the, those are the things I asked myself. And by the way, 
when I'm putting this music together, I'm not really thinking about me. I'm thinking Death Clock is thinking. They're making the decisions, you know. Mm-hmm. There's like there are voices in my head that are that are kind of like take over. So, so all I am doing is trying to facilitate what Death Clock wants and trying not to screw <laughs> it up. So that's that's kind of what happens. So it's it's all a big, you know. You go deep into character through all the writing, through all the music, through all the acting, and through the directing and through the producing, and you come together and you go, "Yep, this whole thing, these." three things this movie and these two records meant to be watched listened to and listened to in a different way so that's the whole idea is like how many kind of like sonic and visual things can we lay on top of one another and and tell a story hey man i agree so all right last thing we got is uh is the tour man let's talk about your upcoming tour um yeah how did you end up co-headlining with baby metal i think that is epic man i can't wait to see you guys in orlando Oh uh, yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. Um well that's a good question. You know, it's really funny and it really didn't take long because we knew we were going to go on tour. We knew when it was going to happen. And almost immediately uh the agent the agency that I work with, APA, who, you know, represents me sure. as a musician and a, you know, a writer and everything. They said, "Hey, one of their first, you know, they pitched a few things, but all I heard was baby metal. And I thought, yes, Death Clock and Baby Metal. That's an evening of heavy metal entertainment if I've ever heard of one. Because <laughs> there's not going to be any show like that. You're going to have a smile plastered on your nose. So I think, I think it's a really good pairing. I have so much respect for what baby metal does. I think they just, you know... To me, it's like an evening of Las Vegas heavy metal. Like, like heavy metal's taking over Las Vegas, and this is the show you get. So, I think this would be a lot of fun. I have uh, been preparing with Gene uh, Hoagland. You know, we talk about this is the kind of thing. You know, we, we played a picture. We played a picture, which is a gigantic movie theater size screen. And so, Gene is playing. He's got a headset on, and every downbeat is coinciding with a cut. So we have a very intense audio and visual performance. So for me, for what I do, it's the ultimate fun thing I I can do to kind of celebrate what Metalocalypse is, what what the music is, what the show is, what these characters are, and put it all in one place, and and both you know try to entertain with music and make you laugh at the same time. So that's what we're bringing to the table, and uh, we're really excited to get on the road. I can't I, I can't wait because we've done a few one offs. In the last few years, we did one about a year ago uh, in Philadelphia, and then we did another one in Los Angeles around 2019, which is a project together again. And one-offs are treacherous because you have one shot to get everything right, and a tour is just like you get to live in it, you get to travel around and see America, and you get to say hi to people. And to me, that's exciting. So I was going to mention – you know, what are some of the cities that you're looking forward to visiting most besides Orlando? <laughs> uh, well, I am excited to see to see all the heavy metal friends in Orlando. Uh, <laughs> I, I played there before and I loved it. And uh, there's so much heavy metal history and, and so much heavy metal uh, death metal foundation in Florida. We all know it. And um, and it's really great to, to go back there. I don't know, man. It's it's hard to it's hard to to because I love the big cities I love the small cities I love all the stuff in between whenever I'm whenever I'm on the road and just travel some of my favorite times is getting in a car and driving across America and seeing seeing how close we really are to each other yeah. and seeing that uh, no matter how different people are we all kind of agree on some of the same stuff which is like heavy metal guitars and cartoons and comedy <laughs> we can all kind of agree on the same thing and uh, to me that's pretty great you know. That's awesome. Um, and just just finding, yeah, it really it really is great because again, I can go and have a conversation about heavy metal or horror movies or whatever it is with people around uh, the U.S. and and that's fun. So I don't know. I lived in Boston for a long time, so I always like going to Boston. Um, I spent a summer interning for you know Jingle Houses when I lived in New York, so I like to go and check out New York. Um, I'm from Illinois, so I like to go to Chicago. Um, I uh, then we're you know we're gonna be in Nebraska. I never spent any time in Nebraska. And one tour took us to Fargo, North Dakota. Um, so I'm always excited to go and eat food and chat with people and just hang out. So I don't know. I'm I I can use it. To me, it's a vacation. So uh, where I, I have to it. work for one hour every night. 
Sure. That's cool. Yeah. And, and um, so what special treats can we expect for the tour? And be besides Gene, who's going to be accompanying you in the band? Is it just you and Gene? Well, Gene, yeah, it's still Gene. Gene is like, uh, Gene is so important to this, to the execution of the show. And Gene is musically hyper intelligent. He's a perfectionist. He is an easy guy to hang out with. So I always, I'm always happy to, to hang out with him. Brian Beller, who has been on the Death Clock shows since the beginning, uh, he plays, you know, with Joe Satriani. He's played with Steve Vai. He's part of, um, uh, He's he's with the aristocrats. He's a monster musician, and he went to the same music school I did, Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, and then we have Neely Brosh, who uh, did the last two one-offs with me, and she is uh, an excellent musician. She is so great, and she does so many crazy, funny things, from playing with Danny Elfman to like being in Cirque du Soleil. And she is just a monster guitar player. I love her tone and her vibrato. So it's going to be fun sharing the stage with them. And uh, what you can expect is, you know, um, there are going to be a couple new pieces of music that you've, you know, that's that will be on Death Album Four. And then we we want to show you, you know, again, we're celebrating some of the uh, the earlier stuff that we've done, and you know, all there will be highlights from every single record, including the Doomstar Requiem. So nice. So that's what we got, and uh, yeah, it's really fun because, and, and this is not like any other show where we have to kind of figure out what our we have to get in you know just book time with an editor so we can like visually edit the whole show and sonically edit the same thing so everyone knows what to do and then once we lock it in we're kind of well, that's what it is unless we want to get an editor out and kind of switch up our order and change things around it's not like just jotting down a set list on a piece of paper and sticking it you know with gaffer's tape on the floor <laughs> you know, like plan months ahead and figure out what it is that you're going to do because it all takes a little bit of pre-production that's awesome, man. I love it. Yeah. So um, with the Army of the Doomstar uh, acting as like the final chapter in this series, you know, um, you know, I, I have to ask, like, is this the end of Metalocalypse or is there going to be any chance for more? That's a good question. That's a good question. I guess we'll see how this thing does, you know. Um, you know, I... Uh... I I think there's always going to be a story for for these characters. I think there's always a way to do something. Um, and uh, I think the music will live forever. I think touring can probably happen forever. But like I said, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I don't uh, I think the really important thing that I really wanted to do was make sure that first episode and this last movie all tied in sure. the whole series and everything all kind of ties together. Because I was telling, what I wanted to do was tell the story between Death Clock and this tribunal, and who Death Clock is where they start, and who Death Clock is when they finish, and um, and that was to me that was the thing that you know I was I had made peace with the possibility that I would never be able to do it because I already knew the story in my head, so it was okay for me, and maybe I'd whisper it to somebody along the street or something if they wanted to hear it, but um. But I feel very satisfied knowing that we got to finish the show in in the series and in, in this movie, the way that we we kind of intended to from the beginning. So, is there something in the future? You know what? I'll tell you this. There's one song on the record that makes me think if I were to do something else with Death Clock, it'd be something in this energy. And I'm not going to tell you which song it is. I'll let I'll let you figure it out. But there's uh -huh. one song that I think is kind of like, yep. That, that to me is just getting back into the fun of it, you know, because this is a big, huge, epic, grandiose journey in this this last movie. Oh, yeah, dude. It's epic. Epic for sure. So, all right, cool, Brandon. Listen, I appreciate you uh, taking out some time, my man, and I'll be sure to uh, push this movie and album albums as much as I possibly can, dude. I appreciate it, and I like your backdrop, by the way. Hey, man, no doubt. Appreciate it. Thanks.